Hello boys and girls, welcome again to a story for you. We are on chapter 12 of Little House in the Big Woods by Laura Ingalls Wilder with the pictures by Garth Williams. The Wonderful Machine. Next day, Pa cut the heads from several bundles of the oats and brought the clean, bright yellow straws to Ma. She put them in a tub of water to soften them and keep them soft. And then she sat in a chair by the side of the tub and braided the straws. There's a picture of. <clears throat> Sorry. She took up several of them, knotted the ends together, and began to braid. The straws were different lengths, and when she came to the end of one straw, she put a long new one from the tub in its place and went on braiding. She let the end of the braid fall back into the water and kept on braiding till she had many yards of braid. All her spare time for days, she was braiding straw. She made a fine, narrow, smooth braid using seven of the smallest straws. And she used nine larger straws for a wider braid and she made it notched all along the edges. And from the very largest straw, she made the widest braid of all. <coughs> when all the straws were braided, she threaded a needle with strong white thread and began at the end of one braid so that it would lie flat after it was sewn. This made a little mat and Ma said that it was the top of the crown of a hat that she kept. Um, then she held the braid tighter on one end and she kept on sewing it around and around and the braid drew in and made the sides of the crown. And when the crown was high enough, Ma held the braid loosely as she kept on sewing around and the braid lay flat and was the hat brim which is the part that comes out. When the brim was wide enough, Ma cut the braid and sewed the end fast so that it would not unbraid itself. Ma sewed hats for Mary and Laura and of the finest, narrowest braid. For Pa and for herself, she made hats of the wider notched braid. That was Pa's Sunday hat. And then she made him two everyday hats of the coarser, widest braid. When she finished a hat, she set it on a board to dry, shaping it nicely as she did. And when it dried, it stayed in the shape she gave it. And there are the pretty hats that Ma made. Isn't that amazing? We see those, we don't even think about it. Okay, I'm sorry, I'll keep reading. <coughs> Ma could make beautiful hats and Laura liked to watch her. She learned how to braid the straw, and she made a little hat for Charlotte. Excuse me. The days were growing shorter, and the nights were cooler. And one night, Jack Frost passed by, and in the morning there were bright colors here and there in the green leaves of the big woods. Oh, hey, it's almost fall here, too. <clears throat> All the leaves stopped being green and they were yellow and scarlet and crimson and golden and brown. And all the rail fence had sumac and it held its dark red cones of berries above bright flame colored leaves. Acorns were falling from the oaks and Laura and Mary made little acorn cups and saucers for their playhouses. Walnuts and hickory nuts were dropping to the ground in the big woods and squirrels were scampering busily everywhere gathering their winter store of nuts and hiding them away in the hollow trees. Laura and Mary went to watch, or went with Ma to gather walnuts and hickory nuts and hazelnuts. They spread them out in the sun to dry <clears throat> and they beat off the dead outer hulls and stored the nuts in the attic for winter. It was fun to gather the large round walnuts excuse me, and the smaller hickory nuts and the littlest hazelnuts that grew in bunches on the bushes. The soft outer hulls of the walnuts were full of a brown juice that stained their hands, 
but the hazelnut hull smelled good. Oh, I thought I had something in my teeth. And tasted good too. And when Lori used her teeth to pry open a nut, everyone was busy now for all of the garden vegetables must be stored away. Laura and Mary helped and picked up the dusty potatoes after Pa had dug them from the ground and pulled the long yellow carrots and the round purple top turnips and they helped Ma cook the pumpkin for pumpkin pies. And with a big butcher knife, hi buddy, Ma cut the big orange colored pumpkins into halves and she cleaned the seeds out of the center and cut the pumpkin into long slices from which she pared the rind, which means taking it off. Laura helped her cut the slices into cubes. She put the cubes into a big iron pot on the stove and poured in some water, and then she watched while the pumpkin slowly boiled down all day long. <laughs> That's my black kitty, Johnny, and he came to visit today too. All the water and the juice must be boiled down and the pumpkin must never burn. The pumpkin was a thick, dark, good smelling mass in the kettle. It did not boil like water, but it bubbles came up and then it suddenly exploded, leaving holes that closed quickly. Every time a bubble exploded, the rich hot pumpkin smell came out. Laura stood on a chair and watched the pumpkin for Ma and stirred it with a wooden paddle and she held the paddle in both hands and stirred carefully because if the pumpkin burned, there wouldn't be any pumpkin for pumpkin pies. After dinner, they ate the stewed pumpkin with their bread, and they um, it made it into a pretty shapes on their plates. It was a beautiful color, and it sm um, and smothered and molded so prettily with their knives. Ma never allowed them to play with their food at the table. They must always eat nicely everything that was set before them, leaving nothing on the plates. But she did let them make rich brown stew pumpkin into pretty shapes before they ate it. At other times, they had baked Hubbard squash for dinner. The rind was so hard that Pa had to, or that Ma had to take Pa's axe to cut the squash into pieces. And then the pieces were baked in the oven. Laura loved to spread the soft insides with butter and then scoop out the yellow flesh from the rind and eat it. For supper now, they often <clears throat> had hulled corn and milk. That was good too. <clears throat> I'm so sorry. It was so good that Laura could hardly wait for the corn to be ready after Ma started to hull it. And it took two or three days to make hulled corn. The first day, Ma cleaned and brushed all the ashes from the cook stove, and then she burned some clean, bright hardwood, and she saved its ashes, and she put the hardwood ashes into a little cloth bag. And that night, Pa brought in some ears of corn in large, plump kernels, and he nubbed the ears and shelling off the soft, chafed are chafy kernels at their tips, and he shelled the rest into a pan until the pan was full. Early next morning, Ma put the shelled corn into a bag of ashes in the big iron kettle, and she filled the kettle with water and kept it boiling a long time. And after the last kernels of corn began to swell, and they swelled and swelled until all their skins split open and began to peel off. Hold on one second. Here's Ma working on the corn. <clears throat> when every skin was loose and peeling, Ma lugged the heavy kettle outdoors. And she filled a clean wash tub of cold water from the spring, and she dripped the corn out of the kettle into the tub. And then she rolled up her sleeves of her flowered calico dress with who her elbows and knelt by the tubs. And with her hands, she rubbed and scrubbed until the corn, oh, rubbed and scrubbed the corn until the hulls came off and floated on top of the water. Often she poured the water off and filled the tub again with buckets of water 
from the spring and she kept on rubbing and scrubbing the corn between her hands and changing the water until every hull came off and was washed away. Ma looked pretty with her bare arms plump and white and her cheeks so red and her dark hair smooth and shining while she scrubbed and rubbed the corn in the clear water. She never splashed one drop of water on her pretty dress. When the last when at last the corn was done, Ma put all the soft white kettles in a big jar in the pantry. Then, at last, she had hulled corn and milk for supper. Sometimes they had hulled corn for breakfast with maple syrup, and sometimes Ma fried the soft kernels in pork grindings or drippings, but Laura liked them best in milk. Autumn was great fun. <clears throat> there was so much work to do and so many good things to eat and so many new things to see. Laura was scampering and chattering like the squirrels from morning to night. One frosty morning, a machine came up the road. Four horses were pulling it and two men were on it. The horses halted, um, hauled it up to the field where Pa and Uncle Henry and Grandpa and Mr. Peterson had stacked their wheat. Two more men drove after um, it. Oh, two more men drove after it. Another smaller machine, and Pa called Ma to the um, threshers. Oh, that the threshers had come, and then he hurried to the field with his team. Laura and Mary asked Ma, and then they ran out to the field after him that they could watch if they were careful not to get in the way. And Uncle Henry came riding and tied his horse to a tree. And then he and Pa hitched up all the other horses, eight of them, to the smaller machine. And they hitched each team to the end of a long stick that came out the center of the machine. And a long rod lay on the ground from this machine to the big machine. Afterward, Laura and Mary asked questions and Pa told them that the bigger machine was called a separator and that the rod was called a tumbling rod and that the little machine was called the horsepower. Eight horses were hitched to it and made it go round so this was an eight horsepower machine. A man sat on top of the horsepower and when everything was ready, he clucked to the horses and they began to go. There's the man. And there is a picture of them getting the wheat. You should ask your parents about horsepower because your cars run on something called horsepower, but not with horses. They walked around in a circle, the horses did, each team pulling a long stick, stick that it was hitched to and following the team ahead. <clears throat> and as they went around, they stepped carefully over the tumbling rod, which was tumbling over and over on the ground. And then um, their pulling made the tumbling rod keep rolling over and the rod moved the machinery on the separator, which stood beside each stack of wheat. All this machinery made an enormous rackety rackety clanging sound and Laura and Mary held each other tightly at the edge of the field and watched with their eyes. They had never seen a machine before. They had never heard such a racket. Pa and Uncle Henry on top of the wheat stack were pitching bundles down onto a board and a man stood up the board and cut the bands on the bundles and crowded the bundles one at a time into a hole at the end of the separator. The hole looked like the separator's mouth and, the, and it had long iron teeth. The teeth were chewing and they chewed the bundles and the separator swallowed them and straw blew out at the separator's other end and the wheat poured out of its side. The two men were walking fast and trampling the snow and building it into a stack. And one man was working fast and sacking the pouring grain. And the, gra uh, the grains of wheat poured out into the separator into half bushel measure. As fast as that measure filled, the man um, slipped an empty one in its place and emptied the full one into a sack. 
He had just enough time to empty it and slip it back under the spout before the other measure ran over. All the men worked as fast as they possibly could and the machine kept right up with them. Laura and Mary were so excited they could hardly breathe. They held hands tightly and stared. The horses walked around and around, and the man was driving them, cracked his whip, and said, Giddy up there, John. No use trying to shirk. Crack went the whip. Careful there, Billy. Easy, boy. Can't go but so fast, no how. The separator swallowed the bundles, and the golden straw blew out in a golden cloud, and the steam, oh, I mean, in the wheat streamed golden brown out of the spat while the men hurried. Pa and Uncle Henry pitched bundles down as fast as they could, and the chafe and dust blew all over. Laura and Mary watched as long as they could, and then they ran back to the house to help Ma get dinner for all those men. A big kettle of cabbage and meat was boiling on the stove, and a big pan of beans and a johnny cake was baking in the oven. Laura and Mary set the tables for the threshers, and they put out salt rising bread and butter, and bowls of stewed pumpkin and pumpkin pies and dried berries and cookies and cheese and honey and pitchers of milk. Then Ma put on the boiled potatoes and the cabbage and the meat and the baked beans and the hot johnny cake and the baked hubbard squash and she poured the tea. Laura always wondered why bread made of cornmeal was called johnny cake. It wasn't cake. Ma didn't lo know unless the northern soldiers called it Johnny Cake because of the people in the south where they fought ate so much of it. They called the southern soldiers Johnny Rebs. Maybe they called it the southern bread cake just for fun. Ma had heard some say that it should be called Journey Cake, but she didn't know. It wouldn't be very good bread to take on a journey. At noon, I think it's like pancakes. I think so, but not positive. At noon, the threshers came in to the table loaded with food, and there was none too much for the threshers worked hard and were very hungry. By the middle of the afternoon, the machines had finished all the threshing, and the men who owned them drove them away into the big woods, taking with them the stacks of wheat. Um, that were their payment and they were going to the next place where the neighbors had stacked their wheat and wanted the machines to thresh it. Pa was very tired that night but he was happy and he said to Ma, it would have taken Henry and Peterson and Pa and me a couple of weeks apiece to thresh as much grain that flails as that machine threshed today. We wouldn't have gotten nearly as much wheat either and it wouldn't have been as clean. That machine's a great invention, he said. Other folks can stick to their old-fashioned ways if they want to, but I'm all for progress. It's a great age we're living in. As long as I can raise wheat, I'm going to have a machine come and thresh it. If there's one anywhere in the neighborhood. He was too tired that night to talk to Laura, but Laura was proud of him. It was Pa who had got the other men to stack their wheat together and sent for the threshing machine. And it was a wonderful machine. Everybody was glad it had come. That's all for our story today. Be sure to let your parents know to like and subscribe. And if you have any comments that you want to talk to me about the story or questions that you have or information that you have, you can tell your parents and they can put it in the comments. And then if they set up their phone or their computer, when they subscribe, then they can click on the bell and that'll tell you every time I put a new video up. I enjoy getting this time with you. Bye-bye.